What do you love about being outside and active? I'm, I'm sure I've spent more time outdoors than in. That just feels like home. Enjoy what you can do because you never know what is around the corner. Just being outdoors in the fresh air, it just clears my mind. Fully immersed in nature is what brings me the most joy. Welcome back to the Outside and Active podcast. My name's Dominic Brown and this week my guest is Anna Harding. Anna is a very familiar face amongst the running community. She has been a presenter on the running channel, a host at the National Running Show and has written for publications such as Women's Running. She's no stranger to races from 5Ks right up to multi-stage ultras. Basically, once she has an idea put into her head to do with running, she does it. Like the time her colleague suggested that she runs a marathon in her mum's 20 metre long back garden. I'm really looking forward to chatting to Anna and thank you to this week's episode sponsor, Festival of Sport. I'll talk a little bit about them later in the episode, but until that time, let's jump straight into that conversation with Anna Harding. Anna, welcome to the Outside and Active podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, When we first jumped on, I said... Happy Monday. It's not Monday, it's Tuesday. So we've already got off to a to a weird start, but it's a pleasure to have you on nonetheless. <laughs> well, I hope you did have a happy Monday and happy Tuesday to you as well. Thank yeah, you very it's, much. Uh, it's one of those, I just feel like all the days are blending into one. I cannot believe that we've gone through half a year already. I thought that the other day. The fact that it's, when we're recording this, it's, it's June is, it's a bit crazy. It's a bit crazy, yeah. but we're into the running season. We're, we're well into the running season. Yeah, it's um, the I mean, today is a a bad example. I say a bad example at the moment. The weather is just so warm um, that it is like early morning runs or nothing. And, um, you know, if you don't get out early enough, I say or nothing. There have been days where I've gone out at sort of lunchtime because that's the only time I've had to to do it. And, you know, it's it's all heat acclimation. It's fine. (laughs) It's very different to getting up and running, though, in. November, December, and it's long sleeves, gloves, hats, and now it's t-shirt tans and making sure you're hydrated. Absolutely. And and, I mean, both of those things for sure. Uh, You know, like the vest tan and the sports bra tan is all over the shop. Uh, But the hydration, very, very key. I'm taking it very seriously uh, and encouraging. So I'm working as a personal trainer, um, encouraging all of my clients to just pop a little electrolyte in their water on a daily basis, just because it's so hot. Exactly. Well, look at that. We've two minutes in and we've already got some some running expert advice (laughs) in there, which I'm looking forward to talking more about your experiences running and also offering some advice to people that might be new to running or might have been running for years, but can always add something into their own experience. But just to begin with, we kick off every episode with a piece of advice. And that is a piece of advice that someone that has joined me as a guest is leaving for someone that's coming on in the future and they don't know who they're leaving it for. And your piece of advice comes from Sarah Stevenson, who is one of the pioneers of British Taekwondo. She was on last week's episode and uh, had an amazing conversation. And her piece of advice that she was leaving for you is quite to the point. It was sometimes you've just got to shut up and get on with it which I think for runners sometimes is quite good advice because if you're three quarters, of, three quarters of the way through a race, whether it be 5, 10K, half marathon or marathon, ultra marathon, sometimes we just need to kick up the bum and say, well, <laughs> we just need to keep running. Um, how do you deal with low points in runs? And also, how do you, how do you take that advice? Can you take that advice? I love that advice. Nice one, Sarah. Um, I think, how do I deal with low points and run? You have to shut up the little voice in your head, the little naysayer that goes, no, thank you. No, I don't like this anymore. Um, And get on with it. And um, it is easier said than done. And in some scenarios, you know, it it takes more effort to shut up that little, that little voice than, um, than others. But, you know, pushing through, and getting to a point where you're feeling you've got to feel comfortable with feeling uncomfortable at times um comes with practice and sometimes even even if you've been running for years and years and years it's you know it still doesn't necessarily mean that you've got the hang of it but you know it does take practice to push through those low points because mentally like running is as mental as it is physical at times, especially on the the longer stuff, I think. That's what really struck me when I started 
learning more about running and the running world is just how important the mental side of it is. I mean, you can go from, again, no matter what distance you're running, go from within 30 seconds feeling really strong, really good, and 30 seconds later, those that, that demon in your shoulder just you know, it gets louder and louder and all of a sudden every step feels heavier. That's what surprised me quite, you know, quite how how quickly it can turn. Definitely. And I, runners don't give themselves enough credit, um, especially, I mean, for me personally, I sort of run for my mental health um, to make myself feel better to um you know try and sort of counteract those feelings of you know depression and, and poor mental health that, that come with you know just life and and having this sort of issue I suppose mm. with my brain but um you know the the runners should give themselves more credit for how mentally strong they are because even if you're struggling in daily life with your mental health the barriers and obstacles that you overcome with your brain in a on a tough run you know should really be something to be celebrated because i think you know <laughs> you put yourselves in some awful situations and and face that adversity head on uh in a running situation and you think oh yeah but it's just my hobby you know i just do it because i like it but it you know it does take some some resilience to to get over those little sort of difficult moments in in running for sure and we're going to chat a, a bit more and, and pick your brains a bit more about that later. But another question we ask everyone on the podcast is, what do you love about being outside and active? So the thing I love most about being outside and active is, well, I was thinking about this the other day on a run, actually. Um, I was running down a nondescript road where I live in the Midlands. It's a really long straight road. It's great for doing intervals it, and it, it just creeps into a lot of my long runs because it connects sort of two urban areas on the outskirts of the main town and I was thinking like I love when I'm in nature and I'm running on trails and I'm you know seeing different sites I love mountains I love hills I love beautiful places and I love seeing them change through the seasons but also I like being outdoors and seeing everything changing so this particular road I hadn't run along since my last training block. So it had been a couple of months and there's a housing development that's being built. And I was running along and I thought, oh, that's really come on in the last couple of months. <laughs> it was it was not very inspiring, of course. Of course, it's a housing development, but I like being able to almost not measure my own progress, but see things change as the months and years go by and um yeah, I suppose that's a bit of a weird answer, isn't it? Are you are you a headphones runner, music, podcasts, things like that, or do you like to sometimes take all of that off and just, especially if depending on when you're running, where you're running, I guess, but take mm. in the surroundings. It's it's it depends. Uh, I go through sort of not phases. I'd say like each run's different. So, for example, I had a really hard interval session last week, and it was boiling hot outside and uh, the only time that I had in my schedule that day to do it was at like one o'clock in the afternoon so it was hot and I was like do you know what I'm taking my headphones with me and I am playing some belting tunes because yeah. I'm just going to focus on that and not the the difficulty of this session um, so that was a headphones run um, but then there'll be other times where maybe I'm just going out so after this I've got a 9k easy run and I probably won't take my headphones today because it's it'll be sort of quite quiet out nobody be out on the roads and stuff and um I'll just soak up the the natural ambient sound we've got quite a lot of birds singing and tweeting which is lovely um so yeah it, it kind of depends on the headphones front and and it's not always songs that I listen to either I do enjoy a good podcast at times good especially answer. If I'm on a long run I like <laughs> yeah especially this one <laughs> um I like um entertaining podcasts funny ones not necessarily always ones about running but I enjoy listening to running ones because I feel like I learn stuff um and similarly with the personal training I'll listen to podcasts that I can learn something from the only difficulty being is I like to take notes so if I'm running and listening to one that's a particularly 
sort of good one for learning. I can't really take notes while yeah. I'm running, which annoys me. I'm, I'm interested <laughs> of your viewpoint on this, but as you can imagine, our office is has a lot of people that love going running and and a lot of them say, yeah, if we're doing, so say we're doing a 10K run or longer, the first three, four, five K, our brain's ticking to think about work or life or what I need to do. But then there's a point where it just sort of all melts away and you become just in, in some sort of running zone. Does that, mm. how, is that how your brain works or does it work in a slightly different way when you go for runs? Yeah, I mean, it depends on sort of my schedule. So if I know that I've got a deadline looming or I've got something that's coming up that I need to give a bit more thought to, I'll probably spend most of the run maybe like unpicking that or thinking about um, preparing for it or what have you. But I do find that on other runs, it's almost instant that actually, you know, I'm running the mile or the kilometre that I'm in. So I'm focusing purely on what I'm doing. If if I know that I've got a clear schedule and I haven't got to get back for anything, um, so some of my runs like in the morning, I know that I've got to be back at a certain time because I need to have time to have a shower and then get the train to work. So on runs like that, I do sort of, my brain's a bit more active in the fact of being distracted from the run and thinking more about what I've got to do when I get home. Whereas if I'm out like I was on Sunday, I didn't have to be back for anything. Um, I do find that it's almost instant that I'm running the mile that I'm in. I'm enjoying it. I'm taking in the surroundings, but also focusing on just the actual yeah. momentum of running itself. I'm just going to take a little break in this conversation to talk to you a little bit about Festival of Sport. Try something new this summer at Festival of Sport, taking place on the 11th to the 14th of August. Keen to get your kids into sport, but still trying to work out which one. This August, Festival of Sport gives 5 to 17-year-olds the chance to try over 20 sports in a single weekend. From American football to archery, kayaking to climbing, and trampolining to boxing, it's all happening at the beautiful Holcomb Park in North Norfolk. What's more, all sessions are led by sports pros, including Olympians, world champions and gold medalists. For the full family festival vibe, there's also live music and entertainment, a wellness zone, a packed international street food village and camping and glamping on site. Festival of Sport is on from the 11th to the 14th of August 2023 and tickets are available now at festivalofsportuk.com. Do you ever go out on runs not knowing how long you're going to go for because I I haven't actually done that too much before I've gone I'm just going to start running and then I'll sort of see how I feel I'm usually going all right this up this is my 5k's or my interval or a long run do you ever just see see how it goes yeah uh, I like to call that the forest gump run I just keep (laughs) on running (laughs) Um, I love a forest gump run I must admit I haven't done a forest gump run for ages um i'm very much in the zone of um specific training at the moment for uh an ultra that i have coming up at the end of the year so uh i am sticking to the plan religiously one because that's how my brain works i i like to be told what to do do it and tick it off and that's done parked to the next also like just because of the higher mileage and um, sort of shorter recovery times. I know that actually if I've got, I don't know, a 20K run to do, that actually going out and doing 30, even if it's a lovely day and I'm enjoying myself, it's not going to help me so much for the session the next day. Yes, that that, I, so. that is very true. <laughs> I, but I, I do love a Forrest Gump run. <laughs> I like the, I love that phrasing as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that from you, Forrest Gump run. Um, I, I want to wind back to where your running journey sort of started. But just before that, I, in these podcasts, I do an intro where I talk a little bit about the guest that's coming on and give people a bit more context. But I always mm. like hearing people's own view about what they actually do. So that's the question. How would you describe what you do now for a living and in the running world yeah uh great question (laughs) if you ask my mother she'd be like i don't know but she's always busy (laughs) (laughs) um i so 
I'm a journalist by trade. Um, I studied journalism at university and I've worked in radio since I was 16. So uh, I am actually um, a freelance journalist. So I do a bit of radio still. I write some magazine articles about running actually now. Um, and I do some presenting on the running channel on YouTube. Um, but then last year I also studied um, for my qualification to become a personal trainer. Um, the reason being was because the stuff that I'd been doing with the running channel, the feedback that we got from people that was like, you've helped me so much in my own running journey. Like, thanks for all the advice. This is, you know, what I've been able to achieve because of it just was so rewarding and such a buzz that I thought I'd like to do this on a one-to-one -one basis. Like I'd like to actually see real life people and help them achieve their goals individually which was why the personal training side of things came along because i wanted to first of all hammer home the important but also as you get older um that you know i cannot um recommend strength training enough mm. uh, just for everyday life and um, but also uh, just because, yeah, like just helping people achieve goals, feel better, feel more confident and also not be the person that I used to be in the gym where I would walk in, look around, feel really intimidated, feel like I didn't know what I was doing and just go and run on the treadmill for 20 minutes and go home. Is this, so I want to help people not do that. Is this personal training in running, but also in strength as well? So it's a bit of a mixture. Um, so the, the personal training is purely strength and I also teach exercise classes as well. Uh, so I have a number of different exercise classes. We do HIT, which is more cardio based. We do um, strength and conditioning for runners and triathletes, which is focused on firing up those glutes and getting strong uh, core and quads. Um, I do a beginner's fitness class as well for a slightly older audience, which again, just helps them stay strong through their lives it's the sort of thing that's going to help them carry their shopping up the hill yeah. and sit down in a chair and get back up again and put stuff away overhead in cupboards like functional everyday movements that are going to enhance their lives so yeah number of classes legs bums and tums that's my favorite they're really noisy because <laughs> it's just a group of women uh, who just like a chat uh, so that's a really good one as well. So yeah, it's it's all strength stuff that I do. I've not gone down the running coaching path yet um, because I feel as a runner, I don't know enough yet yeah. about running to be able to impart my my wisdom as a running coach. Uh, I can give tips and I can give hints, but I don't feel confident enough yet to to actually coach people with their running. I mean, j journalism's where, like you said, where you started, what you studied, but it's you know you've you've gone in front of camera now with the running channel but you've also been on stage hosting at the national running show do those things again are they things that you're seeking out for do they just opportunities that come along and then you you know I mean you're naturally so good at being on camera and on stage and you just take those opportunities when they come I guess yeah it's definitely take the opportunities when they come I'm definitely a yes person um I like to try new things and yeah, I suppose, you know, in a way I do seek out these opportunities as well. But at the same time, I, I like, you know, the, the national running show I've done for three years now, I think. Um, and rumour has it, I'm back in January. <laughs> rumour has it. Um, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that one has kind of just become a stalwart in the diary of like, if it wasn't there, I'd be really sad mm. um, because I just I thoroughly enjoy that gig and then um yeah the running channel stuff kind of landed at my feet because of the journalism because I was working at a, a radio station in London I was news editor for global radio which is um like Tool Heart, Smooth, LBC yeah. basically most commercial radio stations in the UK and I was working out of Leicester Square and I went to a PR do for Strava uh, and interviewed Joe Pavey, head of the London Marathon. And the, one of the PR guys that was there for Strava had had an idea that he'd like to set up a YouTube channel uh, about running um, with running tips and hints and races and everything in between. So I had a conversation with me about it, asked me what I thought about it. 
I thought it was a great idea. I'd only been running maybe 18 months at that point. Um, but I knew that there was a gap in the market and like a lack of resource on, on the video content front yeah. at that point because I'd read every single running blog there was going to try and get every piece of information I could when I was training for my first marathon. Um, and so, yeah, he sort of said, do you, you know, what do you think? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. I'll, I'll help you out with that. Uh, not realizing that actually what he meant was it was a full time gig <laughs> and that I'd need to leave radio, which was quite a scary prospect, but I was ready for a change at that point And sort of yeah dived in headfirst with zero subscribers zero content and zero social media <laughs> followers so yeah that was quite scary but um it paid off it's great the, the running channel community has grown and grown and grown and then last year i felt it was my time to sort of step back from the full-time running channel stuff uh to focus my time on other projects and so now i get to do bits and bobs of everything which is the best of both worlds i mean it, it must be amazing if, and, and you know this is now I, I want to look back to where running started but it must be amazing looking back at where that journey started to now where you find yourself in the running community and going wow that you know just gone from finding this you know getting that running bug to now being involved in these massive parts of the industry it must be amazing I mean where did where where for you did running start where did you first get that bug or where do you remember what your first run was yeah, so it is mad looking back at it now. And I was living with a friend in Yorkshire. I was well, and I decided I put my name in ballot and didn't get in. What a surprise! <laughs> so I decided that rather than just going, oh well, never mind, like I did every year, I would actually take it upon myself to enter a marathon. Because if I didn't get into the ballot, then I wasn't going to do it otherwise. So I'm like, right, I'm going to I'm going to do this. So I signed up to Edinburgh Marathon. Uh, a friend of mine uh, was killed in a one punch attack uh, out on a night out, um, which was a really tricky sort of time for my group of friends. And um, we all sort of coined a phrase of be more Bav. Um, Bav, the guy who who died, he was my age and a real go-getter like he had his own business and he would never say no to anything he was really like seize the day and so we coined the phrase be more bav in order to you know make the most of what we have because you never know when you know it could be your last night out or your last whatever um and so in order to be more bav for me i was going to be more bav and run a marathon before i was 30. Um, so I signed up, uh, having done like a part, uh, I'd done the great North run like three times in Newcastle yep. for work for Metro radio, uh, never trained for it and couldn't walk for like a week afterwards every time <laughs> Classic, yeah. and swore never again every time. Yeah. But I was, I wouldn't ever have described myself as a runner. And so it was a challenge. And so in the January of the year of Edinburgh Marathon, it was the very first national running show. And I'd heard about it and I'd got tickets and I went along as a journalist for Global Radio and I did some interviews. I interviewed, uh, ooh, who was it? Testing I your memory. Was, yeah, I know. I did some really cool interviews anyway with some very good runners and I was just in awe of them. And... I was like, this is really cool. Look at all this like gear that you can get. These cool people who run, like I want to be like this. So that kickstarted my training. And I went from couch to marathon from like February to May. Wow. Which is not advisable. <laughs> it's doable. It's doable. But I was very, very committed. I was like, never miss a session and tick it all off. Like really focused because yep. At that point, you don't really know how much you can get away with not doing marathon training. I do now. <laughs> um, and that's where it all started. I, I was aiming for a sub four marathon. I got injured on like my last long run. I was going really well at the race. And then my injury, my IT band flared up big style, like 16 miles into the marathon. And the last 10 was a bit of a hobble. Um, and I came in in 4.07. Oh. And I was just like, ah. 
I really wanted sub four and that was it that that was like right well I'm gonna have to run another one now so I continued chasing that sub four journey and just got just fell into running um yeah that, so the <laughs> experience the experience of that the experience of that first edda that that first edinburgh marathon i mean people that haven't maybe aren't involved in the running world or haven't mm. taken on a marathon before always talk about or, the, or think think about the wall that people hit did you have that mm. experience of hitting a wall or was it the injury that almost took up all of your physical and mental energy just focusing on getting through that and battling through that yeah, for the Edinburgh Marathon, I would say it was less wall, more IT band, more injury. Um, it was, uh, I don't think I've ever truly hit the wall as such. There have been points in races where I've gone, I, can't, I literally cannot continue any further and then eaten something and then been like, oh, turns out I can. I think a lot of people can, <laughs> so, can relate to I that. Guess to some degree. <laughs> yeah I guess to some degree there have been some walls but it I think when you hear about it um from other runners or um particularly the one that I remember I watched run fat boy run the night before I ran the uh great north run one year and he hits the wall and I think there they like proper make it into a wall that he runs into I don't think as a runner for me anyway it doesn't necessarily present itself obviously like that at the point you are just a bit like depleted of energy and tired um so yeah that's um that's a lesson in fueling anyway make sure you take on fuel before it arrives <laughs> a- absolutely lesson lesson number two after electrolytes in the heat um on, on the flip side of that you know, talking about hitting, hitting a metaphoric wall, but there's also a thing such as a runner's high. So I guess mm. in your words, I imagine it's something that you have experienced before. For someone who might not have, or, you know, wants to get a bit more of an idea about running, what, in your words, do you, would you consider to be a running runner's high and what does it feel like? So a runner's high is scientifically proven, in fact, and it's to do mm. with endocannabinoids in your head, which are basically a little bit like cannabis, like the feeling of of having cannabis, apparently. Like, (laughs) I've never had cannabis. Um, But uh, it is like a chemical reaction in the brain. So the feeling personally of a runner's high, I would say nine times out of ten usually comes once you've finished running and your body is like, Wow, that was so good. I feel great. And actually, you know, there'll be people who are listening, you know, this is outside and active. This is all different sports, right? So there'll be people who are listening who've maybe taken part in other activities who will also feel the same. It's just sort of branded as a runner's high. So this morning I went to the gym and did my strength session. And afterwards I was buzzing. I was like, yes, I've like ticked off a session I've made a good start to the day and I feel amazing I feel like I'm walking on clouds um and it, it's that rush of endorphins yeah. that you get that that just makes you feel great and 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 this is why I mean I've I've heard people start to be um if, if people are having mental health issues, they're actually prescribed exercise to go and do because of, you know, like you said, there's a sci- science behind a runner's high of, of uh, you know, even that, that could be the gym, that might be cycling or, or a walk or a hike or whatever. And yeah. I imagine this is a reason that, that people say, if you are struggling, get out and do something, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, running is obviously such a good way of doing that. And you said earlier in the podcast that, it's a great way for you to be able to look after your mental well-being as well. I mean, how has it supported you in your journey? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, there are so many studies out there about prescribing exercise for, you know, to, to see improvements in anxiety, depression, any sort of mental illness um, that actually I wouldn't be surprised. I, I feel like maybe some doctors 
do already do it or at least suggest it let's not say prescribe yeah. they're not going to write it out on a piece no. of paper and suggest say, Take it this to the pharmacy but um but not, and not only just exercise but also just time in nature so even if you don't you know if you don't want to get sweat on or you know if it's, it's not quite you know you're not quite there yet even just like a gentle walk in the woods can really lift your mood. Like it's that quiet and that time out and our like general life. I just think it's mad how much pressure is on so many people to always be contactable, you know, mobile phones to always be on as it were always on. Mm on and always like thinking about work or you know just whatever it is family life like social engagements just always from one thing to the next to the next to the next and you know to the point where self-care has become a thing where basically that is just like some quiet time like read a book or you know actually carving some time out to not do anything because that's no longer the norm that's like that's like a luxury for so many people mm. um and so for me like running is is almost that self care if I, I was going to say if i'm not training for anything even if i'm training for something like today i've blocked my run out in my diary once we finished on here i'm going out for a run and i'm not going to sit and do my work i'm going to do my run and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to then finish off my work because I know that I'll have a bit more clarity. I won't be like, oh, I've got to go and do this run and it's going to be hanging over me until I get this work done. So, yeah, my my brain kind of is very busy all the time and um, running just quietens down that side of it because running is so simple. All you've got to do is get your kit on and get out the door and I you know I've made that sound really simple because for some people and on some days for me even getting out of bed is tough like if you just get out of bed and like brush your teeth and that's all you can manage for one day great like you've won but if I get out of bed I get my running kit on and I get out for my run I'm like king of the world. <laughs> well talking of accessible activity and exercise I was reading an article that you'd written I was reading it the other day and it was a, a lot of it was talking about park run and how great that is at getting people into a non-pressurized environment for being active tell me a bit yeah. about your experience with park run and why you see it as so valuable to people that might be finding running for the first time yeah I love park run I I think park run is one of the single best things that has happened to, I'm going to say just this country. I know it's in lots of other countries, but the, the health of the population of this country, um, because of how accessible it is. So it's timed, it's every week at the same time for people who crave, um, routine, this is great, big tick, nine o'clock every Saturday. For people who crave company or community, big tick. There's always people there who are willing to have a chat. If you're an introvert or perhaps, you know, you're anxious about being around other people, that's fine too. You can literally turn up, blend into the background, do your thing and then go home. Like you don't have to engage in the community if that's not your thing. So I think that's great. If you're an injured runner, you can volunteer. Whether you're injured or not, you should volunteer. But, you know, it gives you that opportunity to still be involved in the running community if you're not running. Um, and you can just do it at your own pace. There are tail walkers at every park run. That means you will never be last. And when I tell people this who are perhaps, you know, not as into running as me, which is most of my friends, because they all think I'm bonkers. <laughs> they're, they're like, what? I won't be last. And I'm like, no. There's always tail walkers behind you. Yeah. So you'll never come last. So you don't need to worry about that. And it also gives you that, you know, self-competitive edge of, of having goals and being able to beat your times. That gives you a massive high as well. I'd say that that's probably part of the runner's high too. If you beat your PB at Park Run, oh, you're a good buzzing feeling. for the rest of the day. 
Oh yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there are just so many different facets to it. It's so well organized. It's completely run by volunteers, which just blows my mind. The kindness of people out there is just phenomenal. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it is for everyone. I think, I think you've summarized that so nicely. And we've actually had, um, Bruce Fordyce as a guest on the podcast and he was part of the team that helped bring Pot Run to South Africa and yeah. he was talking about, just as you said, the, the positive impact it has o- over in this country, but also the tremendous impact it's having out in South Africa as well. And he even, he, he, um, he spoke of a story where they somehow picked up the radio frequency in a park run in the Midlands or the, vice versa. And they were talking about in South uh-huh. Africa how they had, a, I think it was either a lion um, or another one of the big five on the route of the park run and the the park run in the midlands in the uk was picking up this frequency and getting quite worried that some for some reason somewhere in the midlands there was a there was a, a lion in the middle of the park run track um but you're, you're so right you're so right i mean i'm desperately trying to get my my mum to come to park run and she's like no no i won't be able to everyone's there's a runner i'm like no trust me there is such a a welcoming an accessible environment and I guess for new runners it's a great place to go because running can be intimidating for the for the first time and what I think I mean that leads me quite nicely onto my next question about advice for new runners because we've spoken about the national running show and you can go there and you can be very overwhelmed with all of the trainers the kit the technology the nutrition the races the ultra marathons but actually the beauty of running is that you can be involved in all of those things and have the latest gear and take on the newest challenges and the best races but actually if you have a pair of trainers that you've you know had mm-hmm. for years and some running equipment and a bit of impetus to get up and go you can you can find yourself in that running community and you can become a runner in inverted quotation marks absolutely um just gonna throw some caution out there of if you've had trainers for a long time in the back of your wardrobe you might want to just maybe True. just check that they're not going to give you shin splints more, or of advi- more advice um, <laughs> more good advice <laughs> that was my only like Woo. um good trainers good trainers and a sports bra for women um now that you know everyone sort of says running's an easy sport running's a an accessible sport running is a free sport to some extent that is true you can get carried away with all of the gear and all of the stuff and actually you know there's some excellent work being done by groups like black trail runners to encourage more black um minority groups black and brown people to uh go running on the trails for example because trail running which is a you know a huge love of mine does come with more expense and more equipment if you want to stay safe you want to keep yourself st- safe out on the trails you do need to invest in in more kit so you know there is that side of like stuff for running but for new people getting into running i mean i love that you said that you're trying to get your mum to go to park run i made my mum come to park run with me <laughs> and she loved it good um, I'm, using, I'm, I'm sound biting that clip yeah and um my sister as well like we've done a few races together my sister's pretty fit she's a PE teacher but she's a busy mum of two and doesn't get much time to herself to go out running like and give actually have that impetus to go out and be motivated to do it on her own but she'll run if somebody runs with her so we were in Wales on holiday at Easter and Obviously, the first thing that I did when we booked it was look at where the nearest park run was. <laughs> and there was like two equidistant. So I picked the park run and I was like, right, on Saturday morning, just so everyone knows, I'm going to be going to park run. Everyone's welcome. Let me know if you want to come. So my sister and my other half came down to the park run. Um, the others all stayed and had cooked breakfast, which is fine, whatever. <laughs> um, but it was just, it was really nice to be able to run with my sister there and, and get her out running. She felt great afterwards. And then the next day on the Sunday, she was like, can we go for another run tomorrow morning? Uh, like this morning. I was like, oh yeah, it's great. So yes, I think encouraging people around you to, to sort of join in with you is really lovely as well. But for beginner runners, there is, I would say, no better place to start. And I, yeah, I'm not working for them i've not paid any commission for this it's completely free uh is the couch to 5k app um 
I think this is an incredible resource. I think it's um, a manageable introduction to running. It basically takes you literally from couch to 5k with set runs that you can do each week that will safely and steadily build you up. And it teaches you that it's okay. It teaches you that it's okay to take walk breaks. And it is okay to, te to take walk breaks. Like a run does not suddenly become not a run because you had to walk for a bit. Like, and I want that to be widely known to everyone because I think there's a misconception with running that unless you're running the whole time, it's not a run, not true. I could not emphasise that anymore. I'm glad you said that. But um, flicking from very accessible park run and couch to 5K that you've just spoken about to a couple of the bigger challenges and bigger events that you've taken on. I mean, in lockdown, you did a backyard marathon and that is quite literally a backyard marathon. Tell me a bit about the inspiration behind this and some of the numbers in terms of how many times you had to go around your garden and how many times you had to turn and stuff like that and, and that whole experience because that seems incredible. Yeah, so um, the Backyard Marathon, I was um, in a bubble, remember bubbles? Um, with my mum and my stepdad at their house uh, during lockdown and uh, working remotely as everybody else was too and, you know, the, the I was working full-time for the running channel at this point and we were coming up with... We wanted useful videos for people to stay connected with the running community and to give some sort of inspiration and some ideas of, you know, different things that you could do. So we'd done a couple of at home workouts that people were following along with. We did, um, you know, we did some tips on like how to stay part of a running group when you can't be together. So loads of different ideas of like running virtually with people. And then we had like a, we had a, an ideas meeting on the Friday and Andy, the boss went, oh, well, Anna, why don't you just run a, mar a marathon in your backyard? And I was like, what, what now? And he was like, yeah, I just do it at the weekend. And I was like, um, yeah. OK, so so I am literally like unless I can see something that's like a definite no, like it's dangerous or um, I'm not like physically fit enough for it or whatever. I am a yes person. So when he said that, I was like, yeah, I could do that. So I planned my backyard marathon for the day after, like the, the following two days. So. Sunday is race day in running world. So obviously Sunday is backyard marathon day. I made myself a little bib, had the running channel. And I think I was like number one, two, three, pretty sure. Um, and I made myself a medal for the end as well out of like tin foil around some cardboard and a piece of like garden twine and uh, set out to measure the backyard. Now off the top of my head, I believe, oh, maybe it was 20 meters. It was very short. My mum's back garden was really tiny and it just had a path that went from the back door to the back gate. So I was like, right, well, if I run up there and back again, then that's like 40 meters and then did some maths to figure out how many laps I would need to do uh, in order to hit a marathon. And it was something ridiculous, like 1,190 laps or something. I mean, yeah, someone someone's going to literally do the math there and go, well, it can't have been 20 metres. I can't remember exactly what it was. But I like, I, um, I got up had my, my pre-race breakfast and literally treated it like it was race day. It was really fun. And um, I did it to raise money for the NHS charities and the World Health Organization um, as like a bit of a message to stay home. <laughs> it's really weird talking about this now because I'm like, I cannot believe that that was the life that we lived in at that point during COVID. But yeah, it was kind of a stay at home message. It was like, you can do stuff at home without leaving. Um, sure, if you want to go for a run, like we were allowed to go out for exercise and what have you. But 
I I wanted to show that you know there there is things that you can do at home um and yeah I finished it I think I think it's still to date my slowest marathon ever I think it took me just over six hours but I did have like a cup of tea towards the end and stuff um my mum held up a little sign cheering me on and yeah we treated it properly like a race day and I had a toilet roll finish line it's the first time I've ever run through the finish tape as the winner of a race um I will take that um as a proud moment <laughs> in my running career uh but yeah it was um it was super fun and then really crazy because like the world's media then picked up on it and I was on Good Morning America and stuff, which was really, really weird, uh, but super fun. Amazing. I mean, and then you go you go from doing something like that during lockdown to then your experience of the Boston Marathon qualification. I mean, that 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 was a whole amazing video series, emotional ups and downs. I mean, tell me about that and what you had to do and the, the difficulties and then the experience of running boston marathon which is you know one of the the abbott major marathons yeah so it was um that was that was tough so for my age group and for my gender my boston marathon qualifying time is three hours and 30 and my um marathon pb before i started the training was three hours 50 so i had 20 minutes uh, to shave off, which was a big ask from the start. But I had a brilliant coach in Andy Hobdell. He's coached Olympians and phenomenal runners and he gets it. He knows what he's talking about. So I was working alongside him. I was working alongside um, Josie Perry, who is a sports psychologist who was giving me sort of all the tools that I needed to push through the, the mental mental bits and um, a great physio as well. And we all just basically created this team to get me through this training to run a Boston Marathon qualifying time. Um, I was out on a, an interval session. I was absolutely flying through the training. It was going really, really well. Um, until, uh, well, the first <laughs> after the first maybe three weeks, I tore my calf um quite badly and I had to completely take time off running for about three weeks I think um I managed to ease back into some cycling and then when I came back into my training I literally had to start again like run walking um and then I was on my penultimate long run and something went we're still not entirely sure what it was. My physio was like, it's probably something to do with your lower back, but it was presenting itself like all through my leg. There was a, a one one time my calf would hurt, then my quad would hurt, and then it was somewhere else. And it just was really, really painful. And it was about two weeks to race day. Um, and I was racing at the Berlin Marathon. And I had to have a very frank and, and pretty upsetting conversation with my coach, having put all this work in to get to to do this race that, um, you know, this wasn't going to be my race to to get this Boston qualifying time. And so my main objective was to go to Berlin and to enjoy it. Um, I would say I probably didn't enjoy the race because after about five or six K, something sort of popped something didn't feel quite right with that injury um and and I was in pain for the majority of the rest of that marathon um there were a lot of tears it was very very painful there was a lot of like grit to get through it and I was determined that I was going to cross that finish line and I would say that's not the best advice for runners out there but in my head that was the only thing that I could do that day that was the only objective that I had so I finished the race I was obviously thoroughly disappointed that I wasn't able to go anywhere near a Boston qualifying time um but I was uh doing the I was doing a, a sort of video training series alongside Adidas who'd sponsored it um and they'd given me loads of support throughout the the training they'd been really sort of generous and kind um with their encouragement they knew the score with the injury 
And I, I was sat down um, at the finish area, um, sort of filming the last bit for the video. And one of the producers from the Running Channel handed me an envelope and it was from Adidas. And it was sort of a, you know, really well done. We know how hard it's been, um, but you've inspired loads of people to you know, chase their goals, even though they're big, lofty goals that can look quite scary. You know, you got stuck in and you did your best which is why I would like to give you a place at the Boston Marathon. And I was so shocked. I was so shocked. I burst into tears, obviously. Um, then I was like, oh my God, I've got to train for another marathon. <laughs> um, but it was phenomenal. So that was in like the September and it was the following April was the Boston Marathon. And to have the chance to do that was like once in a lifetime I was so lucky like as a sponsor Adidas gets certain number of places that they give to whoever they see fit so I was really fortunate that they felt it was appropriate to give one to me um and running Boston was just phenomenal it was a it was a marathon where I didn't want to aim for any time I didn't need to aim for any time and I wanted to just soak it up and and experience it yeah there was a really famous dog on the course called Spencer who was a golden retriever who sadly passed away this year um but he was like well known in the Boston community he was well known by all the runners and when I got to his little cheer point there was a queue of people waiting to stroke him and have photos with him so I joined the queue and I got a photo with him like that's how easy I was taking this marathon <laughs> um so yeah, Boston was incredible. I would like one day to properly qualify for it, get a bit of redemption and just prove to myself that I can do it. Um, just because I feel like, you know, having a place handed to you like that is not a situation that many people find themselves in. And so, you know, I feel like I want to earn that one day. Um, it's not currently my goal, but who knows in the future yeah well Anna just as you said you you were you know very lucky and appreciative to have that space in the Boston Marathon we've been very lucky and appreciative to have you as a guest on the podcast and, and really interesting hearing your thoughts about running and offering pieces of advice for people and then just before I ask you for your final piece of advice for someone coming onto the podcast in the near future where can people go to find out more about you and to follow your running journey yeah, so uh, the majority of my running journey, I well, I share everything, the good, the bad and the ugly on my Instagram, which is Anna the Runner. So it's Anna dot the dot runner. Perfect. And just finally, it can be about anything. It can be about running. Uh, but for, for for me to offer to a guest coming on in the near future, what is your piece of advice? So my one piece of advice can be applied to any part of your life it doesn't have to be exercise it can be anything but my piece of advice is done is better than none so if you don't feel like going out for your run or doing session or you know you've only got 20 percent of you to give that day try and give that whole 20 percent to what you're doing because that is 100 percent of you so just get your kit on and go out the door run for five minutes if you feel like you're really not feeling it, go home. It's fine. You've tried it and it's done and it's not none. Anna, better I, than none. I think that's a great way to end the podcast and I look forward to passing that along. Enjoy your run that you've got scheduled in now and thank you for coming onto the podcast. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode with our lovely guest, Anna Harding. Thank you so much to Festival of Sport who sponsored this episode. And thank you to you for listening. If you think you know someone who would enjoy these episodes just as much as you, then please, please do share it with them. And let's grow this outside and active community. We'll be back next week with another episode and another amazing guest. But until that time, enjoy the outdoors.